is Rocky Forest reporting for the news. We're in the middle of a building campaign here, as you can tell, we're building a house, a house, Christ's home, our heart's Christ's home. So that's what's gonna be going on in worship. So get ready for a building project as we get ready for Jesus coming in Advent. See you in worship. The Lord be with you. And also with you. We light this candle as a sign of the coming of the light of Christ. Advent means coming. We are getting ready for the full arrival of God's ki kingdom. The nations shall beat their swords in the plowshares of their spears, burning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. Lord God, your kingdom has come into our world in your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us to be prepared to make way into our hearts of that kingdom. We thank you for its coming, for the ways it changes our world. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, that we might rejoice in its transformation in our world. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our prayer of confession is printed. Let's pray this together in unison. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hear the good news. As far as the east is from the west, that is how far God has removed our sins from us. Let's believe the good news that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven, transformed to begin again as the followers of Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, come now, day. 
forever 
that stone was moved for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe over the souls of all who saw to the father I restore Do you see anything different in church today from what's usually here or what has been here? Yep. Um, the stable and the Christmas tree. Okay, stable and the Christmas tree. Other things that you see? Well, the table's usually here, but what's the table covered in this time? What color? Purple. Purple. Yep. It's all the candles and the wreath. Candles and the wreath. Anything else that's different? all the purple, and we have four new banners, right, which are dark blue. What do you see that's different? Yeah, what do you see on the table? Do you want to get up and look at it closely? Sure, you can get up. Get up and have, have a quick, good look and tell us what's up there. Yeah, okay, that, but what, what, are, what silver things are up there? And, right, okay, thanks. So, today is the first Sunday in Advent. The four weeks that get us ready to celebrate Jesus' coming. And so, the four candles, so there are five candles, I know, but there are four big ones around the outside and the Christ candle in the middle. And so, we'll light one each week as we get closer to Christmas. And on Christmas Eve, we light the Christ candle because Jesus Christ has come. You'll see that that banner and that banner have the candles on it to remind us of that. Now, this banner and that banner, they are the same. They have what on them? In a, yep, a crown. Because of what? Because Jesus is the new king. You're right. And a cross. You're right. And to be really tricky... You see that thing that looks like a P at the very top? Well, in Greek, that's not a P sound. That's an R sound. So the, the cross should sort of be more like an X to be a chi, and then the R, the P thing, is an rho, chi, rho, Christ, the first two letters of Christ. So it points to the cross. And the purple is the color. Purple has two meanings it's the color of royalty, right? So you've got Jesus here dressed in royal purple in this um, stained glass window. But purple is also the color of repentance, of saying we are sorry, of getting ready, of preparation. And so we're preparing for the king. 
Now, next week we'll talk a bit more about some symbols of Advent, um, but we're going to cut that now, and you can come back next week and get more on Advent. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for Advent, that we get ready to, that we can prepare for your coming, get ready for your coming. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading is going to come in two parts today. Um, at first, the first piece is, so, the theme for our Advent series is My Heart, Christ's Home. And so, picking up an idea of home, each week in Advent, one of the scripture readings will have been filmed in people's homes, and we will see the video. So, in other words, we're turning the camera around, as opposed to them watching us, we're watching them. And so, we'll be in people's homes. Um, and so, that will be the first reading, and then John will do the Isaiah passage. But let's start with a word of prayer. God of grace, open our ears to hear from you. Speak to us your word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 121. If I lift up my eyes to the hills, where shall I find help? My help comes only from the Lord maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot stumble. He who guards you will not sleep. The guardian of Israel never slumbers, never sleeps. The Lord is your guardian, your protector at your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will guard you against all harm. He will guard your life. The Lord will guard you as you come and go now and forevermore, the word of the Lord. Thank you, Jean. Second reading is from Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 11. And I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. Foreigners shall till your land and dress your vines. But you shall be called priests of the Lord, you shall be named ministers of our God. You shall enjoy the wealth of the nations and their riches you shall glory. Because their shame was double and dishonor was proclaimed as their lot. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess a double portion. Everlasting joy shall be theirs. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels, for as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. This is the word of the Lord.
So I'm going to break the rules I was taught about how to preach with this sermon because I want to tell you where I'm going and then get, try to get there. So as I've said, this Advent season, we are thinking about the theme of my heart, Christ's home. And over the next four weeks, today and the next three weeks, we'll be thinking about those places where Christ coming to our lives brings change and transformation. And this week in particular, we want to think about the ways in which Christ coming to us, Christ coming to live in our lives, brings hope and joy in the face of discouragement, despair, bleakness, etc. And the other weeks will pick up on other themes around that idea of Christ coming to live in us, live in our hearts and lives. The passage that was read from Isaiah 61 calls clearly for this truth that we know the brokenness, we know the reality of grief, the reality of discouragement, the reality of being caught by powers beyond ourselves. Maybe not ourselves directly, but we see those around us. It doesn't take long to build a long list of signs and symbols and places where brokenness happens in our world and people are caught by that brokenness, where pain exists in people's lives all around us. I mean, to pick on one more example, to name one specific example, this week, those of Ukrainian descent remember the Holodomor, Holodomor, which was 90 years ago, this week started as Stalin and those around him essentially committed genocide against the Ukrainian people over the winter of 1932-1933. And so it's one example, and we could produce many other examples of this kind of brokenness and pain that exists in our world. And Isaiah 61 says there is another story. There is a deeper truth. There is a transformation that is on its way. There is something happening. God knows and God is going to turn sorrow into joy, replace anxiety and fear with courage and praise to bring comfort to those who are grieving, that God is in the business of doing that, and that that process has begun in Jesus Christ, that in Christ coming to live among us, the promise is that that will be fulfilled. Now, all of that just sounds like words. And so I want to tell some stories today, some stories that I think point to this very truth, that God is in the business of bringing transformation to people's lives, bringing hope and joy in the midst of despair. In 2017, September 2017, Mary and her five children arrived in Winnipeg. The Presbytery of Winnipeg was sponsoring them as refugees. They had been in Kenya, bouncing between bachelor apartments in Nairobi and the Dadaab refugee camp, which at the time was a refugee camp of two million people and one of the most dangerous places in the world to live. Mary and her family were Noor people from southern Sudan who had faced incredible persecution, and that's why they had fled to Canada. When we picked up Mary and her family at the airport, we met Namal, the oldest of her children, who was 13, and the only one who had significant amount of English. And I asked Namal, so how did you get through Canadian customs in Toronto? And she, without batting an eye, at the age of 13 said, I talked to them. A 13-year-old navigating Canadian customs on behalf of her family. When we finally got them to their house, picked up their stuff and got them to their house and settled them in a little bit, Mary said, I want everyone in here to pray for this house and so I can sing a song. And she sang a song of hallelujah in the Noor language. They found a place, a place of belonging. A couple of weeks into their being in Winnipeg and in their house, Mary started to talk about her husband, Peter. Peter was still back in Africa. 
she hadn't heard from Peter in two years because Peter had headed off into Sudan to find work. It's not uncommon in southern Sudan, South Sudan, for people not to be able to have work, and therefore the men go off to find work to send money back to their families to keep them alive. And Peter had done that, but not, had been not heard from in two years. Now, in that part of the world, that probably means he's dead. But Mary asked, can you try to help me find him? And so a process began towards that end. Now, we moved, and so the rest of this story we now know third hand. Debbie and I know this third hand. Well, miraculously, Peter was found. He was found because he'd just been released from prison in northern Sudan. He had tried to mobilize justice for the newer people who were working in the same area that he was, and the Sudanese police did not take well to that, and not only arrested him, but broke one of his legs in six places as a sign of don't do this anymore. But he'd been found and was now, he's now, in Winnipeg with his family. Hope in the middle of a story of deep darkness, transformation, joy, lives now as that family has found peace and a place to belong and with great joy is engaged in the life of church that where they attend. God is in the business of bringing hope and transformation in bringing about changes in people's lives in bringing this kind of complete revolution to people. And that's the promise of Advent, that God is still in the business of doing that. But not all the stories that we know around us are ones of people being lifted so dramatically as the story of Mary and Peter and their family. There are people for whom the difficulties still remain, but the hope of Jesus Christ lives in their lives. I've been involved with healing and reconciliation around residential schools for a number of years. And in 2014, I was invited to speak apology confession on behalf of the Presbyterian Church in Canada at an event being held at the site of the Cecilia Jeffrey School, a school the Presbyterians ran just outside Kenora, Ontario. And the way this particular day was set up was that three of us from the dominant culture would speak words of apology and confession and be followed then by three survivors who would tell their stories, people who had been pupils at Cecilia Jeffrey. Usually it's the other way around in my experience, but this day was built this particular way. And so I said my piece and the others said their piece and then we began to listen to the stories of those who had been to Cecilia Jeffrey. And the stories, as you may know, are harrowing loneliness that students experience is a dominant theme that all of them share, along with other challenges in their lives. The woman who spoke second told stories about what had happened to her at Cecilia Jeffrey, but there was a different tone to the way she spoke, a tone that I was not used to, a tone of forgiveness, a tone of reconciliation, a tone of hope. And I said to myself as I was listening to her, this is new. This is not the kind of story I'm used to, not the tone I'm used to. And then I noticed the keys that she was wearing around her neck were on a lanyard, and on the lanyard were the following words, I heart Jesus. And in that moment, I recognized what was the source of this reconciliation, the source of this hope, the source of this forgiveness that she was speaking of. She had found that in Jesus Christ. She had found that Jesus had touched her life. And although the realities of what she experienced as Cecilia Jeffrey were still there, were still part of who she was, she had found a forgiveness and a hope and a transformation in this one who had come to her, Jesus Christ, and the healing, the transformation, the hope that had come to her life. And so even in the midst of 
carrying deep scars, we can know that healing in our lives, a transformation, a hope, a forgiveness that changes us, that brings hope to us. I like the line in the passage that talks about the rebuilding of devastations. It's an image that I think is pretty cool. As I walked around many ruins in various places, I think about, so what would it look like rebuilt? There's a camp, Christian camp, north of Kingston, Ontario, called Camp Iowa. And my father served on the board when it was first started, and then I was a camper there for a number of years, including being an ILT uh, in leadership training there to become a counselor. The camp is 160 acres of rocks and trees, and maybe at the best, 10 cleared acres of farmland. This is north of Kingston. This is just the edge of the shield, so you understand that that's not surprising. The, family had, the, the farm had belonged to the Derbyshire family, and by the mid-50s, the Derbyshires were down to two spinster sisters who were selling the farm. The Derbyshires had, ceased, had been broken by this land. Their family was now down to the two sisters. And as business, the business people from Kingston who were thinking about a Christian camp talked to the Derbyshire sisters about the sale of the property, one of them said, I've always dreamed that something good would happen to this land. This land that was a difficulty for us, that it would be do something good, that good could come from this land. Well, in 1956, a camp, Christian camp was started on that land. As I've said, I was a student, I, I was a camper there and also an ILT and a counselor and went on to become a program director. And in the two years before me and the two years after my time as an ILT, in those five years, there are seven of us from those five years who are in full-time Christian ministry. I'm not saying that's the only way to serve God, but the desire that something good would come out of that land that's one small picture of what has come out of that land, a devastation being rebuilt, being transformed, being made new. God is in the business of bringing change and hope and transformation to the most difficult places in our lives and the life of the world around us. Sometimes it's slow, hard work. Sometimes the signs seem small and slow and growing, but they are real and they are true. Sometimes the changes are as dramatic as they were for Peter and Mary. Sometimes it's learning how to live by the grace of God with the burdens we carry. Sometimes we get to sit on the edge of watching a devastation being rebuilt by the grace of God alone. God is in the business of doing these very things, and we are invited in Advent and other times, to let that Jesus Christ into our lives, into our hearts. To touch the places in our lives that are hurt and broken. To touch the places in our lives that are a burden and scarred. To touch those places in our lives that are a devastation. For He is the one who's come to give us the oil of gladness instead of sorrow. A garland of praise instead of ashes. To give us courage and praise in the space of in the place of anxiety this is the promise of the christ who has been born in bethlehem who's coming to our lives is true thanks be to god amen gracious god father son and holy spirit we come before you this morning as your people, redeemed and rescued by your grace, brought near by your love, and encouraged by your hope. We give you our thanks as we think of the ways in which you have blessed us. We reflect on the time of something like normalcy after a long and exhausting time of a world gripped by fear and illness. 
We thank, we thank you for this space that we call our church home. And we think of those around the world who do not have a place where they can worship freely. We are grateful for that freedom. We thank you for the ways that you have gifted us and used us to reach across the divide to those who are in need, both locally and globally. We think especially of the work of hearts and, and its leadership. We ask for your guidance and continued blessing on them. We think of the generosity of the people in, in this congregation during our Operation Christmas Child shoebox drive. We pray that you would bless those and use those for your glory. We thank you for the numerous opportunities our youth group has had to work with local nonprofits and charities, places like Alora House and the Pregnancy Care Center, and for the other numerous ways that you are using people in this congregation to serve your world. We thank you. We thank you that we see new people coming to our church, joining our family, and participating in the life of our church. We are grateful for the world in which we live, and that you've made it for us, and that you've made it to sustain life and to be beautiful. You are a good God, and so we praise you. Thank you. And at the same time that we offer our praise and our thankfulness, we also acknowledge that there is deep sorrow, pain, grief, and suffering in our world. We know that things are not as they should be. And as we begin this season of Advent, we are made very aware simply by looking at the world around us that we are in the dark. We need you, Lord. And so we come to you bringing with us our burdens and our hardships. We lift up those in our own congregation right now who are struggling through loss, illness, hardship, and sorrow. We lift up those in need of care, both at home and in hospital. We ask for your intervention in their lives. Would you heal them, Lord? Would you comfort them? Would you please be their hope and their strength in these trying and difficult times? We know you are with them, so we ask, gracious Father, that you would make yourself known to them. Open their eyes that they may see you. Help them, Lord. We know that in the world, there is much to ask help for. We think of Ukraine and the war and the suffering that is going on there. How long must we watch this? How long must we ask for your help, God? Please, stop this. We think of those in Iran, Myanmar, and places like Yemen, where more than 23 million people are in need of assistance in their daily lives. How long, Lord, will you forget them forever? Lord, sometimes the darkness seems too strong, and so we ask for your light. We need you. We need you to act and to save us. We know that you are working, even when it is hard to believe. We know that in the midst of the, the things that people are suffering throughout the world, there are glimmers of hope there are places where your gospel is being preached, where people are coming to know you as the true life. Help us not forget that we who, are, live, we who live in relative comfort are in need of this life as well. We need to be confronted by the truth of your word 
We need to give all ourselves to you. In this time of silence, we make our prayers known to you, and we know that you hear us. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I'm going to sing, make room within my heart, O God. The tune is well known. The words may be new to us, but the tune we know. This table belongs to Jesus Christ. He is the one who invites us to eat and to drink with him, to participate in what he is doing in our world, to let him into our lives. And so those who love him and want to love him more are invited to eat and to drink. This table doesn't belong to me. It doesn't belong to St. Andrew's Church. All who love Jesus want to love him more are invited to eat and to drink. It doesn't matter if we haven't been here in a very long time or we come here frequently, we are still invited. Because he wants to come and change our lives to live in us, to bring hope and transformation. Let us pray. O holy God, Father, almighty creator of heaven and earth, with joy we give you thanks and praise. It is our duty and delight, O Lord, to give you thanks and praise. You created the heavens and the earth and all that is in them. You made us in your own image. In countless ways you've shown us your mercy. We praise you that in coming to us in your Son, Jesus Christ, your promises have been fulfilled and the day of our deliverance has dawned. 
We look for the triumph of Jesus' kingdom and we exult with holy joy. How wonderful are your ways, Almighty God. How marvelous is your name, O Holy One. You alone are God. We bless you for creating the whole world, for your promises to your people Israel, and for the life we know in your Son, Jesus Christ. Born of Mary, he shares our life. Eating with sinners, he welcomes us. Leading his followers, he guides us. Dying on the cross, he rescues us. Risen from the dead, he gives us new life. Therefore, in celebration of your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we take this bread and this cup and give you praise and thanksgiving. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, that this bread and this cup may be for us the body and blood of our Lord, and that we and all who share this feast and all who in the past have shared this feast with us that we may be one with Christ and he with us. Fill us with joy that we may be his faithful people until we feast with him in glory. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in you, the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread, when he had blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this, remembering me. So if you pull back the cellophane on the top of your cup, you'll get the wafer. At the retreat yesterday, the comment was made that one of the things that COVID has done is that right now the plates would be being passed, right? Plates of bread and there'd be silence, there'd be pause. And what COVID has done is it's made all of those silences disappear. So we're going to put them back in because silence is important to listen to God. So before we eat, Let's in silence come in joy and celebration and thanksgiving for God's gift to us. the bread of life, eat in celebration. As the meal was ending, Jesus took the cup. He said, this cup is a sign of the new covenant, the new relationship between God and human beings. Every time you remember me and my love as you eat and drink. And if you pull back the aluminum foil, again, let us pause in thankfulness for the gift that we have received in Jesus Christ. Cup of salvation, drink in celebration. You'll find in your bulletin, it'll also be projected on the screen, the prayer for after communion. Let's pray this together in unison. O oh God, you have so greatly loved us, so long sought us, 
and so mercifully redeemed us. Give us grace that in everything we may yield ourselves, our wills, and our works, a continual thank offering to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Stand a warm welcome to all who worship with us. It's good to get together to celebrate God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There are other announcements here for your perusal. You'll find the red insert in your bulletin as an opportunity to make gifts of hope over Christmas that support the children of Haiti and hearts. Well, the offering will now be received. God of grace, we thank you for this opportunity to share with you what you have given to us. Use these for your honor and your glory in this, your world. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's join together in singing Our God Reigns.
And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit, is now and forevermore. Amen.